Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter uh, 17, and we're going to start reading at verse 16. Acts 17, start reading in verse 16. Uh, before we get started with, with reading, I just wanted to uh, maybe say a little something to try to like, you know, whenever I used to go preach at the jail or wherever wherever I would get an opportunity, I would, uh, I would oftentimes tell my testimony to people just because, like, I don't know about you, but I'd like to know a little bit about the person that's talking to me. And uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about the testimony of the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when it comes to it, when it comes to intelligence, was an extremely intelligent man. He was a scholar of the Jewish religion. He understood the Old Testament scriptures, meaning, you know, if you don't know a lot about the Bible, let me just say this: in the Old Testament, God explained through the prophets in many times and in varied ways that the Christ would come one day. And when we use that word Christ, uh, you know, that word literally means the anointed one. And so God would say that he would come, and and, 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 and it, even though Israel as a whole didn't realize that God had spoken through the prophets in places like Isaiah 53, where it says that he was like a lamb led to the slaughter, and he did not open his mouth, and that he bore our iniquities upon him. And in Psalm 22, David wrote that they have pierced my hands and my feet. And in Zechariah, the prophet wrote that they will, when he returns, that they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only son. So what I'm trying to say is that God, even in the Old Testament, had prepared his people, the Jews, that he had created to, be, to understand that, that the Messiah or the Christ would suffer. Right. And uh, but yet at the same time, at the time that Jesus came, they didn't expect they still didn't catch that. And they didn't expect that to, to be the case. Like they didn't expect it to go down the way that it went down. And they rejected Jesus. And we know the story that they were part. The Jewish people were part of having him put on the cross. The Apostle Paul became very angry. And part of what we're going to what we're going to read to this morning is the fact that the, the whole world of that time was, was in an uproar because of this new sect, if you will, or this new religion that was rising up. Because as these people that were becoming born again, that were receiving new life in Christ, were getting saved, it was causing turmoil everywhere that they went. You know, and that wouldn't work, that doesn't work real well in today's society, by the way. And we're going to, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but I'm just letting you know that the enemy has been very slick and very wise in the atmosphere that he has created in the earth today, where it becomes very uncomfortable for people around you if you live your life out loud or vocally or, you know, in any way like that where you mention Jesus, it just causes a real discomfort in the air, right? And so the Apostle Paul was very angry about that. And he, he went into an uproar and he started persecuting Christians. And if you'll remember the first martyr in the Bible, you may not remember now, but in Acts chapter 6 and 7, there was a man named Stephen. And he said, the Bible says he was a man full of the Holy Spirit. And he, one day he, he came into contact with some religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, and he began to preach to them Jesus Christ and that God the Father. He really preached the whole Old Testament and told them that this is that Jesus that you took and you hung him on the cross. And the Bible says that they became so angry that they gnashed on him with their teeth. Can you imagine that? I mean, we're talking about smart people, religious people. Okay, that's the trick, religious. And that they literally started to write. It sounds like the Bible says they did on this one. I mean, think about that. How can you like a barbarian, dude? You turn it into an animal. What? You're, you're basically a demon possessed, obviously. And then they stoned it. You know, you know, and the Bible says that Saul, now this is, the, this is before the conversion of Saul. His name was Saul, then his name was changed to Paul. It says that Saul was consenting to their death. That means basically, if you read the tradition, he was the highest ranking official 
in the area. And what it says is that they laid their coats down at Saul's feet. That means he gave them permission to move forward. And the Bible said that they began to pelt Stephen with stones. And the last words that ever came out of his mouth were, I see the heaven go. Yeah. And the Lord was standing there. I preached a message one time when Jesus stood. And what my point was, the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But when Stephen saw him in heaven, Jesus stood up. Wow. Yeah, yeah, like, I'm, I don't know if that's really right, but I'm just saying, like, Jesus has given this man a standing ovation. Yeah. Like, you, you, you went through with it. You, you did what I called you to do. And, and Stephen, Stephen, that's the last word that he says. And then you watch the, the coming and going of the Apostle Paul, and you see this radical conversion. And we're just going to talk about one little spot in Acts. This morning, but I want you to know that if you can only imagine the work that this man did for the kingdom of God, and but yet now he's angry. And listen, he got even more mad after the stoning of Stephen. And the Bible says he was on his way to Damascus to get paperwork from the from the officials so that he could persecute Christians even more. He wanted to throw them in prison. He wanted to go pull them out of their houses. He wanted to have them killed. And the Bible says that when he was on his way to Damascus, a bright light shone and knocked him to the ground. And the Lord began to speak from heaven and say, Saul, Saul, why do you kick against the pricks, is what the King James Version says. Some translations may say the goads. And what is that? Because, you know, nowadays they got electric cattle prods and they just bump those cattle in the hindquarters to get them moving. But back then they had sharp sticks. And they'd sit there and they'd poke them in the hindquarters. Why? To get them to move in the right direction. And the Lord's saying, Saul, Saul, you kick against the goads. What are you talking about? The Lord's over there trying to poke you in your hindquarters and you kick it against it just like an ornery animal. Why do you kick against the goats? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? Mm. Who Jesus? Yeah. Who you first? Yes. He became blind. If you know the story, Ananias went and met him on a place called, a street called Straight, laid hands on him, the scales fell from his eyes, he got filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to preach Jesus. Come on. The world has never been the same. In the midst of that, listen to me, listen, whenever the Lord gets a hold of you and he becomes real to you, I'm telling you right now, you want this. You want what I'm trying to talk to you about this morning. You want Jesus to become more alive on the inside of you. I don't care what your neighbor down the road thinks about you. I don't care what your boss is. Doing. You want this Jesus to come alive on the inside of your heart. Because I'm here to tell you this morning, church, that this is what this whole thing is all about. Again, I don't know how many times you can say it. it's not about what kind of car you drive. It's not what kind of house you live in. It's not what your occupation is, how much education you have, how many rent houses you own, how much stock you own. None of that matters in the eyes of God. And I'm here to tell you, I am so convinced that God is real and that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. This is what we're yearning for. This is what we're missing. The whole in human heart is we need to put Jesus. Amen. And so here we are in Acts 17. <laughs> We're going to start reading in verse 16. This is after the Apostle Paul has, had, and now he just, listen, I, I had a whole PowerPoint for you. I was going to show you maps. I, was, I had all kind of little slides. But let me just tell you, the Apostle Paul sailed in the Mediterranean Sea, my friend. If he got to get there by boat, if he's got to get there by foot, he's going all over the place. Now he's way over on the west, in the west. He's heading towards Greece. He started off in Israel over here on this side of the Mediterranean. And now he's way over here in Greece. And he just, everywhere he goes, he's telling people about Jesus. Amen. So it says right here, now while Paul waited for them in, at, at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. And in the market daily with them that met with him. Real quick, let me give you a little bit more immediate context. If you go back and you read the beginning of the chapter, the Bible says that Paul started off in a city called Thessalonica. And it says that as his custom was to do, he went into the synagogue and he began to reason with them from the scriptures that Jesus is that Christ that I speak to. Now, you got to understand, and I, mean, I know some of you are very aware of this by now. Some of you may not, maybe not so much. His name is not Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus 
bought probably Jesus bought Joseph, son of Joseph, but 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 Christ is his title. Again, the anointed, the one that the scriptures had always promised. So when Paul reads it from the scriptures, he says that the Messiah or the Christ must suffer and die and rise again, you see. And then he says, and this Christ that I present to you is Jesus that I preach to you. And the Bible says that people began to believe in Thessalonica, but then a certain group of Jewish people got really riled up. And what they did was they came against them and they ran them out the city. So you're like, that's oh, okay, I've been rejected before. I mean, really, if you think about that, how much could in it, how much rejection can we really handle? But anyway, that's another story. So he leaves from Thessalonica, he goes up the road to a place called Berea. And the Bible says of Berea that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica because whenever Paul would preach to them, they'd go home and they'd study the scriptures for themselves. But don't you know that just as soon as things are going good, the devil rears his ugly head again, right? And what happens? Then same Jews in Thessalonica come meet him in Berea and they start causing all kind of trouble again. They, and they're trying to get him thrown into jail, and they're trying to cause all this trouble. And so the brothers that were there supporting Paul snuck him off to Athens and left him there by himself. And everybody else is still back over there in Berea. So here's Paul. I want you to see this. He's by himself. And he's in Athens, and he's walking around. Okay? And it says that, again, going back to verse 17... It, well, verse 16, it says, Paul waited for them in Athens. His spirit was stirred in him. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other, some, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof you speak is. For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians... And strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Some translations call it you are too religious. But I like this word here because in the Greek it's, it actually has the idea you fear the God. So you can see they got all these gods because they're scared they're going to miss one, okay? For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. Do you believe that this morning? I hope you do. Whatever it is that you need this morning, you need deliverance for something, yes. he's the one that puts the breath in your lungs. You need financial help this morning, he's the one that can minister to your needs. You need meaning in this crazy thing we're all in this world, he's the only one that can bring meaning yeah. to the craziness of this world. Yes. You, need, you need relationship help this morning? Amen. He's asking for a relationship with you, and I guarantee you right now, you get your heart right with him, he'll speak to you and show you how you're supposed to treat somebody else. That's good. And has made of one blood all nations of men. I want you to notice that. Has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That goes back to after the Tower of Babel. In other words, God has created from one man named Adam the entirety of the human race. And listen, whenever man tried to rebel against him in Babel, you know what he did? He confused their languages. And according to language, he told each people group where they were going to live because God has a plan. And his plan is that all, every tongue, every nation, every kindred of person would have the opportunity to know him, the one true God.
God, the one that made heaven and earth and all that in them is. That's all God's really wanting to know. Amen. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but all God's really wanting everybody to know is this, is that this place belongs to me. Yeah. You belong to me. Won't you come on? That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him. And find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone. Graven by art and man's divine. <coughs> in the times of this ignorance, God winked at it, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. Whereof he has given assurance unto all men, and that he has raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. Real, real quick, I'm about to be done reading it, and then we're going to talk. But I want to make a point. If you are a witness for the Lord... And you begin to tell people about Jesus. I want to encourage you with something. I want to encourage you that some people are going to think that you're mad. <laughs> some people are going to call you a babbler. But there's others that are going to say, Hallelujah. I'll hear you again. Yeah. Right. If you get your feelings hurt so bad just because somebody rejects you over your Jesus, you'll never be able to be with it. Amen. Let me just say this. See, we're, we're what you call a Pentecostal church. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the initial physical evidence of speaking out of the tongues. But what I need you to know is this. The reason you need to be baptized is that you be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can be a witness for the Lord. Yes. So that you can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what God has called you to do. You, listen, you don't have to come up here and have your hands laid on you. We'll be happy to pray with you. It, it, really, every service, we ought to all be hungry for more of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. But what I do want to tell you is this. It starts with you beginning to ask, Lord, please fill me with your yes, Holy Spirit. Lord, Lord yes. please baptize me with your Holy Spirit. <coughs> fill me up. And listen, the more you look on Jesus, the more you think about Jesus, the more you give worship and adoration to the Lamb of God. I'm telling you right now, one day if you ask and you start fo focusing on Jesus, you won't be surprised because one day it's going to come out of you and you won't know that it's real and nobody's going to have to convince you of it. Amen? Amen. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, we will hear you again in this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and, he, and believed among the which, I thought this was... The, Interesting. I just noticed this this morning. Among which was Dionysius in the Greek. You know what that means? Devoted to boxes. Is that not something? I mean, like, I, I have read this passage of scripture ten times this week. And the first time I noticed that was this morning. The Bible is real clear to say, Paul's over here in Athens. And he's saying, look at all of these gods that you're serving. And one of the <coughs> converts right here on this first day was Dionysius, a, 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 the one that is devoted to Bacchus. You know who Bacchus is? We talked about it before. He's the Mardi Gras king. He's a Mardi Gras God, right? And and here's this man serving like, I was born and raised. I'm a pure Athenian pedigree. My name is devoted to Bacchus. Well, guess what? When Paul preached Jesus in the resurrection, Dionysius left Bacchus and he went with Jesus. Hallelujah. And then, Amen. And a woman named Damaris and others also with him. Now, one of the things that, uh, you know, we don't have to turn there this morning, but I just real quick before we get into this story, I wanted to mention the fact that in Matthew 27, it talks about when Jesus died on the cross. It says that he breathed his last breath. The King James Version says he yielded up the ghost. And when he died that the temple veil was split from top to bottom. Most of us have already understood that what that was signifying, see, that veil separated mankind from the presence of God. So when Jesus died and that veil was ripped, what that represents for you and I now is that Jesus made the way so that you and I can have access to the presence of God. But also, a few verses later, it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves, after his resurrection. I want you to think about this for a second. People that had died, that had heard the good news of Jesus, 
that had died before Jesus went to the cross, that were buried in the ground, and when Jesus resurrected from the dead, their dead bodies came up out of the ground. I don't know if you believe the Bible this morning, but I'm here to tell you, the Bible says, after his resurrection, they came out of the graves, and they went into the holy city, and they appeared to many people. What is your point, preacher? My point is this, is that I want you to understand that, guess what, there's great power in the resurrection of our Lord. Great power. See, it makes dead things live. I need you to know that, because you see, you might feel that spiritually dead this morning. But I've got good news for you, because the resurrection power of Jesus can bring life to your spiritually dead life. That's right. Yeah. Listen, uh, you know, this place, Mars Hill, we talked about the Arapagus. This, I, I had, you know, this picture because I, I said, well, let me see what Mars Hill looks like. You know, you can Google it later if you want to. And it's still a big old rock, and it's in the middle of Athens. I mean, Athens is all built up now. But this place was a specific place where all of these philosophers would go. And this is what they did every day. They would, they would show up to this rock, and they would all get up there, and they would espouse all of their intelligence. Right? And so th it says that the philosophers there, and I don't know if you remember or not, but it said the Epicureans and the Stoics, okay? These were two little sects of these philosophers. You ever talk to people that got it all figured out? You know, just the real smart people in life. I've been talking to some smart people lately, and one of the things that the Lord has put on my heart is this, is that when the, I think this is the title of my message. When the world is too smart for Jesus, you preach the resurrection. When the world is too smart for Jesus, you preach the resurrection. Wait, hold on a second, because a smart person is going to think you're even crazier. They're going to think you're a babbler. And guess what? You know, that was one of the things that the Lord spoke to me last week when I was sitting here and I was looking at that empty tomb. And I said this, the tomb is empty, but my heart is full. And you might come across to somebody as though you're crazy. But i got to tell you something, that the proof of the resurrection is on the inside of you. If you're born again this morning, come on somebody, help me out here. If you're born again, if you're not born again, you don't, you don't even know what I'm talking about. If you're not born again from the dead, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? What does it mean to be born again? I'm going to tell you, not just some little prayer that you might have prayed in vacation Bible school. It could have happened then. I'm not taking away from it. It could have happened while you were nine years old at vacation Bible school. But just because you raised your hand one day in church doesn't mean you're born again. How do I know if I'm born again, preacher? Because, see, when you really get born again, when you really do business in your heart with the Lord, guess what? His Spirit comes to live on the yes, inside sir. of you. Yes, and when His Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, you will never, ever, ever be the same. Your life will be completely, oh, you might try to run from him. You might try to rebel from him, but you will never be happy again. You will search the soil of this earth ten times over, looking for something to fill the emptiness in your heart. And looking for, you you'll remember the day that Jesus first entered in, and for some reason, you won't even go back to that place. Because the enemy, if, if you're in rebellion, will try to convince you that there's something else. And the whole time the Lord's saying, I just want to come back home. I want you just to invite me back home. And then listen to me, friend. If you try to search the world over and looking for something other than Jesus, you're never, ever going to find it. Sister Tick used to say this back in the old days. She said, when you know that you know that you know that you know. I used to think of myself. When you know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. Amen. Yeah. Well, how do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? Because when the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, when you get sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, you will know that you know that you know that you never get saved. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of Jesus I want. Amen. I'm convinced, my friend. I'm tired of I'm tired of trying to try to make this whole world happy. Amen. So when the world is too smart for Jesus, you preach the resurrection. Well, that doesn't even make sense. They're going to think I'm a babbler because they're not saying that the tomb is empty. Yeah, I tell people all the time, listen to me, buddy. Ten years ago, I read a newspaper article, and they found Buddha's bones. And you know what they did? They moved them from one city to the other. Buddha, they found you will never find Jesus' Amen. bones. Hallelujah. Well, that doesn't prove that he, uh, you know, that doesn't prove that, that he really rose from the dead. And again, I know I'm going to keep saying it. But when he lives in your heart and he comes out of your mouth, yeah. I'm telling you right now, if you will pray, listen, 
this is not just a message, just a regular run-of-the-mill message this morning. This is also uh, ministry 101. When you, when you see when you plant seed in somebody's heart, does that even matter to you yet? I mean, if not, you need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. But listen, does it even matter to you yet that you'd be a witness for Jesus? I hope it does. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'll hopefully Lord help my personality. But listen, but, but listen, if that matters to you, you need to also pray for those seeds that you that you throw in the soil. Yeah. Amen? Pray that the Lord would water those seeds. You want to see a soul saved? Don't just give, and don't get frustrated when it doesn't happen with grace. He's the Lord of the harvest. He said, you so see, you want to see, I am the Lord of the increase. Amen. So look, when the world is too smart for Jesus, you just preach the resurrection. Amen. Right. You know, I was thinking about this one scripture. You can go ahead and, and turn it on there real quick to uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 21. I was thinking about all this new stuff in the world today. You know, because people get caught up in new stuff. I, got, I had all this stuff listed. Facebook, Venmo, Twitter, Bitcoin, Tesla, smartphone. Man, everybody's just all into this stuff. You ever talk to people like that? I know I talk to a lot of people. Man, check out. Oh, you don't Venmo, man? I don't, dude, I couldn't Venmo you. If, you. if you need some money, just come out and give me a 20. I'm going to buy you. If I owe you money, that's the best way to get it. I tried to Venmo. It seems cool. Everybody's doing it. I'm not opposed to Venmo. I just don't know how to Venmo. I'm not opposed to Bitcoin. I just can't afford a Bitcoin for 42 grand, okay? I'm not opposed to Twitter. Hey, Elon, buy it and change it and make it better. I don't really care. But what I'm trying to point out is this, is that the whole world is looking for something new. Give me something nuevo, man. I want the good, the smell of new leather. I want, I want everything to be new. I want it to be fresh because, see, this is old now. I'm getting tired of old and outdated stuff, and that's what it said. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time. That's what they do. They'd go up on Mars Hill. They'd spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. The whole world is constantly looking for something new. And now, say, look, whenever, G, whenever Paul went over there preaching Jesus, it was brand new. It was like, what is this bad we're talking about? He brings forth strange gods. He brings forth strange doctrines. Let us hear you more in this matter. We've never heard of this Jesus in this resurrection before. So it was real new at the time. So they were probably like, let us hear you again next week. Right? But in verse 23, this is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, would you worship in ignorance? This I proclaim to you. So they were ignorant about the one. And you got to understand that the whole world, this is still relevant for today, my friend. I put in here, though, also I put these, words, these phrases. I heard of that already. I go to church. I know that. You know how many times I would go out to that Sherman Petroleum Festival and I'd find this dude in the park up by the altar, up my altar, the, the stage, and I'd say, hey man, I just came into this park right here to tell somebody the good news about Jesus. I got this little track right here. Yeah, I don't know, you probably think I'm crazy. They probably thought I was too, but it's okay. That's just what Jesus did to me. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm telling you what the Lord told me to go do. So I went and gave him this track, and he's got and he takes a vessel off his beard. I go to church. I didn't come over here to that. I didn't say he didn't go to church. I go to church. I, I, I would, I've been in vacation Bible school since I was a child. I go to the Baptist church. I, I didn't say you didn't go to church. I just came over here to tell you Jesus loves you, dude, and then he died on the cross. So yeah, everybody thinks they know Jesus is what I'm trying to say. Oh, I've heard of that already. I go to church. I know that. When, well, the Apostle Paul says, I'm here to talk to you about this unknown God. See, you got a God to everybody, but I noticed that you're so superstitious that because you, you were scared you were going to leave the right one out, you got a statue right there to the unknown God. Well, he's the one that I want to preach to you. You see, everybody thinks that they know God, but look, go to Job 42 5. Now, do you imagine in your heart and mind that if anybody ever knew the Lord, it would be Job? All of the things the Bible said that he was a blameless man, he was perfect in all his ways, meaning he was mature in the ways of God. In Job 42, 5, this is what Job says at the end. This is the last chapter. Look at that. I've heard of you by the end of the year, but now my eyes see. See, what I want you to know this morning is this. If you're in this place in some way, shape, or form, I believe you want to know the Lord. 
I don't believe you would have showed up here. I know it's Resurrection Sunday. I get that. And people sometimes feel the devotion to go to church on Resurrection Sunday. But I don't believe you showed up just to do some kind of devoted thing. I'm here to tell you right now that listen, keep on seeking. Keep on looking. Keep on searching. His name is Jesus. Amen. But as soon as you think you're wrong, he's going to reveal himself to you in a much deeper way. And many times you got to go through some things. And Job thought he knew him, but in the end of his breaking, after he lost his family, after he was stricken with boils, Job said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. I'm here to tell you this morning that there's always a deeper level that we can understand the Lord. Amen. And we should all be searching and seeking to know the Lord more. Amen. Don't don't walk out of here. And listen, I use too many words sometimes. But do whatever you do, do not walk out of here thinking, oh, I've already thought about that. You know, I had a I had a, a conversation a couple of weeks back with some people, and that's really what it, I can't get it out of my head, this conversation about the world being so smart to Jesus. I'm so smart, I, I, but I've already thought of it. You know what I'm saying? I remember one time, Aaron may not remember, but when we went to Bourbon Street that time, we had to do Lance Rao and carry the cross out there. Aaron may not remember this, but a, but a guy, I, we were sitting there talking to some dude about the Lord. And he said, man, I already tried Jesus. That, that's, the, that's the spirit of the world. I already tried Jesus. Aaron said, you tried him? You you try it? He said, Jesus isn't some old pair of shoes that you take off and throw in the closet. You don't try him on and then take him off and put him in the closet. You don't try Jesus. You surrender to Jesus. And so, so listen to me. Do not be convinced by this intellectual world that has gotten so smart with all this technology, with all this Bitcoin and its Venmo and all of this Tesla and electric engineering and all of this stuff that they're so smart that they talk you out of believing in this Jesus that died on the cross to set you free. Because you want something new, he offers new life. And what he offers? He offers new life and he offers new hope. Don't let him say, oh, I've heard of that already. Don't let him convince you. Now, it might be time to move on to the next guy. The next guy. But don't let him tell you, oh, I've heard of that already. I go to church, I already know that. You know, this is another thing that's been hit me lately. Whenever you look at all these gods, it's kind of like, and you hear the, the, the place where we are in society, it basically it's the same right now that it was then. Right? All spokes lead to the center. You ever heard that's an old saying, but y'all know what I'm talking about? This, this is more real today than it's ever been in my world. All spokes, that's what they used to say, all spokes lead to the center of the wheel, man. What, what, what are you talking about? Yes, there's all kinds of pathways to get to God, to find your nirvana. To find your happiness. To become part of the spirit of this God. How can you say that your way is the only way? You do you, man. You do you. And then this is the fact. Stay in your lane, dude. Don't, don't, don't get out of your lane. Don't, don't cross over. You're, you're, you're crossing social boundaries. You're moving in an area that you're not supposed to move. But in verse 26, Acts 17, verse 26, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. I want you to see that. I don't know if she can pull that passage up. I want you to see that. It's verse 20, verse 26, I believe it is. 1726. Look at that. He has made. That word right there, made, stuck out to me. Last night, I even, it hit me even deeper. I said, you know, I, I was told that now. I said, you, you know what just hit me? We're walking around on this earth. I hope I can do justice to this thought. Lord, help me. We're sitting around here walking on this earth, and everybody's like, all spokes lead to the center of the will. You do you, let me do me. Don't cross out of your lane, dude. Don't go there. Let everybody have their sin. Let everybody have their happiness. And yet Paul said, he made. He made you. Yeah. He made the heavens and the earth. What are you saying, Paul? Paul's trying to say, this belongs to him. My friend, they may not like it, but this whole thing, I know Peter said you're a pilgrim and you're a sojourner and you're just on traveling through. But this rock we call earth belongs to the Lord. His people that are called by his name belong to him and he has a witness in the land. It don't belong to you, sir. You don't tell me what lane I drive in. I'm not trying to be cocky. I don't want to be one of those self-righteous 
Christians. I don't want to be that way. But don't you tell me what lane i got to drive in. Because my father owns the cattle on a thousand years. Yeah. His streets are paved in gold. And he owns this fallen earth. And he's going to redeem it one day. No, it belongs to him. He made all of mankind from one man, every nation, to live on all this face of the earth. So I'm not going to, I'm staying in the lane that the Lord tells me to stay. Amen. In verse 16, if you could turn to that, it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed. Some versions say he was troubled. This says he was, he was distressed. He, he, it caused turmoil in the spirit. See, it's a little bit of a problem, I believe, if we can just continue to go through life and we never get distressed over the things that are going on. Part of the problem that you and I need is we need God to convince us that this story is in the real. Do you, does that make sense? What I'm trying to say, like, I don't know about you, but I still... I still need the Lord to convince me that Amen. I need him to convince me that this story is real. And, and that resurrection life that lives in you when you're born again, that's, that's the down payment. God's already made it real to you. And if you're not born again, you don't even know what I'm talking about. You're probably aggravated and you want to get out of here. Like, Lord, please get me out of this place. You might even, you're going to turn me off on the video. But if you ever get saved and the Lord comes to live on the inside of your heart, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Amen. Because the presence of the Lord will communicate with your spirit. Spirit cries out to spirit. Deep cries out to deep and says, hey, I'm real. And I think this is your purpose in life. And he was greatly distressed. Because he realized this place belongs to my father. And look at all these false gods. Look at the world. So confused. Look at the world, for lack of a better word, going to hell in a handbag. In verse 27, uh, if you could put verse 27 up there. It says that uh, it talks about that they would seek God. That they would seek God. If they happily, they might feel for him. In the NASB, I wanted to show you this. They use the word grope. <laughs> I know that this is kind of a weird word today. But I looked the word up in the English dictionary. What it really means is to blindly look for something. Okay, it means to blindly look for something. That's what it would say. That they might feel after him. That they would seek God. And perhaps they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. When I was in Norway, I went to survival school in Holland. And we, they put us down in the bottom of this old ship, and they lit a fire. And we had gas mask on, and it was dark. There was nothing in it. They were trying to teach us this thing. They called it ergonomics, is what they called it. I don't know. That's what they said. And basically what you were supposed to do was, you, this is what you had to do in order to get where you were going. You, you would do your foot like this, and you would put your hand out, because you couldn't see anything. And you, and you were walking around, and you could bump into obstacles or whatever. And that's what I imagine. They're groping for him. But I'm just, they're just feeling around. They're trying to do spiritual ergonomics. They're walking around looking for the thing that's missing in their life, and they're blindly wandering in the midst of the darkness. <coughs> feeling around. Feeling around in life, looking, and they don't even realize that they're looking for Jesus. And you know what most of us do as Christians? We're like, oh, yeah, but that's somebody else's job. <laughs> somebody else is going to get that. Somebody else will get that old girl at Walmart whenever I go cash out. And I always look at the same girl. Somebody else will get her. Somebody else is going to get that dude at work. Or somebody else is going to get this person over here. Or whatever. No, no, no. Ain't nobody else. God wants you. They're groping. They're feeling around. And what you and I need is the Holy Spirit filling us up so we can be led by him and the anointing of the Holy Spirit will move through us so that we can help them find the light that they're looking for. Yeah. You know, in the King James, it says they feel, in the, in the NIV, it says they're reaching for him. And I like the way that he is. He says they feel their way toward him. They're feeling around. They're looking. They're groping for Jesus. The Bible says in verses 30 and 31, it says, that in times past he overlooked the ignorance, but now God is declaring to every person that they have to repent. You know, in Acts chapter 3, it says that through repentance comes refreshing. Yes. It's like a cool breeze. That's what, you, if you look it up in the original language, the refreshing word is like a cool breeze. It actually describes a revival. You know, you, you know what you revive? You revive something that's dead. People are walking around dead and they're walking around in darkness. But God is saying, hey, I'm not waking anymore like I did in the past. I've 
sent Jesus, and now I'm demanding that people repent because one day I'm also going to judge. And I'm going to judge through him. And the reason, he, the, why, the reason he can judge that way is because he sent the righteous one. See, he made a way. He made a way for you and I to repent from our old way, which is when we were living in the world outside of God, and to turn to the Lord. That's what the word repent means. Part of it has the idea of changing your mind and going in a different direction. Serving the Lord. You know, I really try to say that for the last year, the Lord's been giving me a real simple concept. There's people that say they love me, and there's people that serve me. And I hope that that doesn't sound too harsh, but that's just reality. And the question that people in this church are going to have to ask, because I'm going to keep asking them every week, are we serving the Lord? I'm asking myself, are we servants of the Lord? You understand? Well, what does that even mean, preacher? Well, first of all, if you serve the Lord, you're going to try to understand what His Word says so that you can try to submit to His Word. Amen? So that you can live for Him in the midst of this world. Oh, no, that was the Apostle Paul's job. <laughs> I'm like, wait, hold on a second. If Peter died and Paul died and Thomas died and mm-hmm. Stephen died and all them died and it was their job, how do we still got Jesus that we even talked about? No, it's not what just their job, it's our job, my friend. There's generation after generation of God's people that have been on the earth. God has a witness in the land, and he's warning you and I that are called by his name. Listen, the secret sensitive church today is not about this. I remember Pastor Brad Bullitt preaching a message one time on personal evangelism, and he said, I, this just makes people feel uncomfortable. It makes people feel uncomfortable. I'm not trying to tell you to go out and do it the way that I would do it, but what I'm trying to tell you is this, and I will never shrink back from it. Normal Christianity is to serve the Lord. Normal Christianity is not just to show up in church twice a week and say, I did my duty. Normal Christianity is to let the Lord be your Lord, amen, and to serve Him and to invite Him into your decision-making. Praise God. Yeah. I mean, if you're married this morning, I think that a proper marriage is supposed, I mean, one aspect of a proper marriage is that you communicate with your spouse about things that you got planned to do. Lord knows I'm probably so busy, I don't always say what I'm doing. But my point is, is that like, okay, I'm just telling you the other day, I told them, and now I might not have done it the right way, but I said, oh, I transferred another couple thousand because I'm going to do this. Okay, and that's how I told her. But she knows. So whenever she looks at the account, she sees a couple thousand missing. She knows that it's gone. I didn't tell her. I didn't communicate with her. My point is, is that if you had a joint account and you pulled two thousand dollars out of the account, you didn't tell nobody. They're gonna be wondering what in the world did you do? What I'm trying to say is, is that you got there's a communication. And if you're in relationship with the Lord, there's supposed to be communication. You're supposed to involve the Lord in your daily activity. You don't just go off and do whatever you want to do without involving the Lord in it. That ought to make sense, my friend. Yeah. You know, like, whenever you just, in the way you treat another human being, yeah. the Lord would say, well, I, don't, I guess you didn't invite me into that one. <laughs> what are you talking about, Lord? I wouldn't talk to them that way. I wouldn't have acted that way. I wouldn't have done it that way. Not, not according to my word, but many times we don't really know his word. I didn't even get in all this, but I'm just saying, many times as servants of the Lord, we don't really know the word of God. Amen. And I don't say that to try to push anybody down. I'm just trying to say we got to get started. If we never start learning the word of God, we'll never learn the word of God. Amen. In Acts 17, 31, it says, Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Amen. You know that that's one of the stories that makes this whole thing different. That's one of the things that's different than every other religion on the face of the earth. That Jesus, first of all, that he died. Somebody had to die for your sin. Because almost every other religion, and even false religions within the, within denominationalism, focus on works. Whereas true biblical Christianity focus, focuses on the work. What are you, what are you talking about? The work of Jesus. See, yes. true biblical Christianity focuses on the work of Jesus and says that that was God's will. Every other religion, every other false doctrine, it all focuses on something else. And many times focuses on what you're going to do 
instead of faith in what he has already done. And God proved it. God proved that he was pleased with the work of Jesus by raising him from the dead. I just want to kind of close right here with these verses of scripture. Look at Romans 8 and 11. It says that the same spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead will dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. What does that mean? It was the spirit of God that gave new life to Jesus. Amen? The Holy Spirit, one with Jesus. He raised us from the dead. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead also can give life to your mortal body. I want you to understand that. The very resurrection power in life. Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want you to know this morning that there's power in the resurrection. The resurrection power of God. Amen. Listen, singers, musicians, y'all can come through the front. We're going to close this thing out worshiping the Lord. Amen. We're going to worship Jesus on the way out of this place. But I want you to know something. The same spirit that raised him from the dead can bring life to your mortal body. Amen. That's right. I want you to know that there's power in the resurrection. I had a cool little graphic I was going to try to show you. I wanted you to know that, and I've said it many times, but I'm going to say it again. Sometimes people are like, well, dude, you got to move on past the cross. They've been telling me that forever. you got to move past the cross. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, what you don't understand is that there's two sides of there's a death side where your old man, born like Adam, dies. And you need that dude to stay dead. You understand what I'm saying? What are you talking about, preacher? My old man, you don't even want to know him. Amen. He was a mess. He was a mess. Who's your old man? Even if he wasn't as bad as mine, he was a mess too. Yeah. You want him to stay dead. And on the other side of the cross, there's resurrection life. There's a new creation yeah. in Christ Jesus. That new creation in Christ Jesus, God wants to give him a new mind. God wants to give him a new heart. God wants to give him a new purpose. Amen. So listen, we're going to just go ahead and worship the Lord this morning. We're going to thank you. If you need prayer this morning, I just want you to know, don't be scared of these altars, my friend. I don't know what prevents people from coming to the altar. I know some preachers get up here and everybody comes to the altar. Other times they don't come to the altar. I just want you to know the altars are open. The altar is a place where you get on your knees before the Lord. The altar is a place where we commune with God. Amen. If you need prayer this morning or if you just want to get along with the Lord, come to the altar. But again, like I always tell you, you can get, you can get along with him in your chair. Amen. Let's just get along with the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen.